My encounter with the faceless man happened this year during Mardi Gras. My boyfriend and I were driving around trying to find a place to park and catch a night parade on St. Charles Avenue. Somehow, we got lucky and got a spot on Marengo Street, two blocks away from the action. It was about 8.30 and the last parade of the day was about to pass by, so we grabbed our chairs, ladder and cooler and headed to St. Charles Avenue. We had been sitting there for a while drinking and talking to a few people when I realised I left my cell phone in the car. Initially, I didn't worry about it. The kids were with friends and I was having way too much fun to worry about a cell phone. And my boyfriend had his, so if we needed to call someone, we could, you know, use his. Float 10 was passing when my boyfriend left in the air for some beads, tripping over the cooler and landing flat on his ass. The whole thing was funny, but he broke his cell phone when he fell. So now with no means of communication and still with at least two hours left before the parade was over, I began to worry about my kids. So I said, I'm going to run to the car and get my cell phone. Walking back towards the car, the street away from the parade was not entirely deserted, but it was quiet. Everyone was behind me and the noise of the party behind me helped with those isolated feelings that I was beginning to have. So then, as I get closer to the car, I noticed a person on the opposite side of the street. Now, it's Mardi Gras, so I think nothing of it at first, until I get this feeling. You know the way you feel when someone is looking at you? So I increased my pace whilst hitting the unlock button on my car keys. When I reached the car, I opened the driver's side door, which was on the street. I didn't want to open the passenger side because it was dark on that side of the car from a row of trees that were in the front yard of a house. I had to reach into the car over to the passenger side floor to pick up my cell phone. And when I climbed back out of the car, phone in my hand, I looked up. On the other side of the car was someone or something standing there right at the passenger side door. At the time, I thought it was a person. But when I looked, to try to make eye contact. There was nothing there. No eyes, no mouth, no lips or nose. Oh, I just froze. The best way to describe it, it was like a mannequin. But what was really weird, it had clothes on, including the Mardi Gras beads. I just stood there for a few seconds, long enough to see the blank face twitch. I thought, holy crap. So I slammed the car door and I took off running back to the parade. The first officer that I saw, I told him that someone was trying to break into my car and I stood on the corner of St. Giles and Marengo. I watched him walk the two blocks to my car. Then I saw the officer circle the vehicle, but when he got to the passenger side, he just stood there for a few minutes. Then he briskly walked back towards me. And so I said, did you see anything? This officer was a black man, not light skinned black. I mean, coffee black. And he looked pale. His eyes were wide open and he was sweating. And he just said, miss, I don't know what I just saw, but when it's time to leave, I will walk you back to your car. Now the parade ended. And when I turned around, that officer, along with another officer on horseback, was there on the corner. They escorted me and my boyfriend back to the car. When we got to the car, I explained to him what happened. To this day, he doesn't believe me. But I will tell you, that officer saw it too, and it was freaky. heard of how my encounter with the creepy clowns ended me speeding off and my boy Caesar firing the AK-47 out of the sunroof but in order for you to truly understand what went down I need to take you back way back to the beginning <laughs>
You see, my boy Caesar and I have been hustled since we were kids. We started off stealing boxes of Snickers from the corner store and selling them on the corner for a dollar apiece. And over the years, we graduated to more hardcore pharmaceutical sales. Our creepy clown encounter happened while we were in a small town whose name I'm not going to tell you. We had just set up shop and started working in the area. You see, the thing about small towns is everybody knows each other. So six new faces in the town is bound to draw some attention from law enforcement, especially when those faces are Latinos. However, we managed to keep ourselves out of trouble, handle our business, and get our work pushed out. It was literally our last night in town. Caesar and I had stopped at a gas station on the outskirts of the city to fill up our tank for the drive home. I had just gotten out of the car, leaving it running, blasting our new favorite song by Drake, I Got Enemies. Caesar was in a passenger seat, bouncing around like an idiot and rapping the lyrics as I walked up to the window to pay for gas. The woman behind the security door slid the metal drawer out, and I asked her for $25 on pump one. That's when I noticed she had this bugged out look on her face, and she asked me if I had seen anyone when we pulled up. I casually answered, nah, I ain't seen nobody. Who you think is out here? To paint a perfect picture for you, this gas station was on the outskirts of town, about five miles away from everything. In fact, it's the last gas station for the next hundred miles. Essentially, somebody cleared a wooded area and dropped the gas station in it. Like I was telling you, I casually said, nah, we ain't seen nobody out here. Who do you think is out here? That's when her eyes got big. She said there were people in clown suits, and they were standing near the pumps with bats and knives and machetes, just staring at her as she walked around inside the store. For a second, I thought to myself, I wish a motherfucker would run up on me in a clown costume as I turned and headed back to my car, and I kind of laughed. But walking back to the car, something clearly had shaken this woman up. Her eyes were big, and she was sweating. She damn sure was shook up. But clowns? Nah, that's some movie type stuff. That ain't what's going on. When I arrived at the car, I placed the pump in the gas tank and clicked a little notch that made it pump automatically. Then I headed to the driver's side window to reach in and get a cigarette from Caesar, who by now had turned down the music and was playing on his cell phone. When I turned around to light the cigarette, I'll be damned. There they were, three idiots with clown outfits on, one standing by the door to the gas station, and two right at the window I had just left. The two standing near the window had bats, and the other one had a machete in his hand. It was clear that these three had been terrorizing this woman all night, so I stuck my head back in the car real quickly to get Caesar's attention and grab my pistol just in case they decided to run up on us. They seemed to be completely ignoring us at first, but for some reason, when I pulled that gas pump out of the tank and hung it up, one of them turned around and started slowly walking our way. The whole situation started to feel like something out of a horror movie. That's when I noticed something moving out of the corner of my left eye. Looking around, I realized that we were actually surrounded by clowns, several of them coming from out of the wood lines across the street and from around the side of the store. I ain't gonna lie to you. Even though I had a weapon, something about this shit scared the hell out of me. So I hopped in the car and rolled up the window. But Caesar, he thought the shit was funny. The next thing I knew, he turned the Drake song back on, opened a sunroof, climbed out with his AK-47, and this crazy bastard started shooting. I hit the gas and we sped out of there. Now I don't think he hit anyone, but man, you should have saw them clowns rolling, crawling, climbing, sliding, running. Oh my God, it was hilarious. I got enemies, got a lot of enemies. In 2009, I did an investigation of the abandoned Six Flags Themes Park in New Orleans East. The paranormal activity there was brought to my attention by several occultists. They used the second floor of the theater for their rituals. These rituals were intense and made use of mirrors to raise demonic entities from a book called The Goetia. I don't dare write or say the names of these entities as it is a form of worship which strengthens them. 
It was very easy to gain access to the park if you knew the schedules of the security patrols. Inside this place, you get the feeling that you're constantly being watched. It's almost as if there's a crowd of people there along with you. The humid night air and strong breeze played tricks on my nerves as I tried to stay calm while walking. You can hear the most random sounds, thumps and squeaks, shutter doors closing. However, as I got closer to the theater, the area took a much more sinister feel. Now, I've been doing this for a long time, and the only instances where I get this type of sensation is when there's demonic energy present. The double French doors to the theater were already open, as if the building itself was waiting just for me. This is where I should have followed my gut instincts and called off this investigation. Because looking up to the second floor balcony, I saw a huge orb of light move past the window. Now, for those of you who don't know, typically orbs are disembodied spirits, but they're never the size of this orb that I saw. It was the size of a basketball. Entering the building, there was a distinct difference in temperature from the humid moist air outside. It was cool and dry. The smell of mold was making my nose flare and burn. The rituals were held on the second floor where they configured mirrors in a circle. These were mirrors that they had found around the abandoned park and they ranged in size from 5 feet to 8 feet. According to the cult leader, if I stood in the middle of the mirrors, the demon would show itself to me. So like an idiot, I did. Standing there, surrounded by these mirrors, initially I was amused thinking to myself, <laughs> these people say they conjured a demon. Yeah, right. Then, a few minutes later, it got real. Coming towards me across the wooden floor was the sound of these footsteps. As it got closer and closer, I could feel the actual floorboards move. Then in the mirror, I saw a hoof and a leg. My eyes traced upward to see what was the most abhorrent sight I'd ever seen in my life. It was the face of a lion with glowing red eyes. The hoofs and legs were attached directly to the face and protruding out from the face were seven other legs with hooves. There was no body, just a face with these legs protruding out of it. The face stared back at me from the mirror and made me feel helpless and powerless. Then it began to move from mirror to mirror, circling me, each hoof making contact with the reflection of the floor in the room and making a sound as if someone was circling me walking around on the wooden floor from mirror to mirror. But the eyes were focused on me. No matter which way I turned my head, the face and the eyes were there. I began to feel lightheaded and dizzy and as I moved forward trying to exit the area, I blacked out. When I awoke, it was 9 a.m. in the morning. A beam of light from one of the holes in the roof of the building shone directly on the center of my forehead. Coming to my senses, I ran out of the building. When I reached my car, I found scratch marks all over my body. But that was not all. I used my cell phone to provide light last night. When I looked at my phone, there was a voice recording. Strange thing is, I don't remember pressing record on my phone. My background is in mixed martial arts, and my upbringing is what forced me to become a fighter. Growing up in the poverty-stricken neighborhoods of East Point, Detroit, was no easy thing to do. The one lesson you learn in the streets is never back down. Those were the words that came to mind the night I had my encounter with the Shadow Man. I had been working security at a local Detroit nightclub. This particular venue was in a very rough neighborhood. And that night, there were several fights. I was forced to rough up a few people and needed to step outside for a smoke break. Exiting through the back door of the club, 
I stepped out into the back alley. Adrenaline pumped through my veins, causing my heart to race and my skin to burn. This was a feeling that I was all too familiar with, and it felt good, but I needed to bring myself down. Standing there, in the middle of the alleyway, I tilted my head back, looking up at the night sky, which was drowned out by the city lights. I was just beginning to calm down when I got this intense feeling that someone was watching me. Have you ever been somewhere and felt a person staring directly at you, only to look and realize that someone is looking right at you? Well, take that feeling and multiply it by ten, and that's what I felt. An overwhelming and intense sense that someone was coming straight at me. As I lowered my head, my eyes focused on what looked like a man in all black walking down the alley. The figure was abnormally large with wide shoulders. It was much taller than me, and I stand six feet six inches. While looking at this thing, I was hit with this intense fear that flooded my body, causing this tingling sensation that pulsed with every heartbeat. My gut instincts told me that this thing wasn't normal and I should run, but my body wasn't responding. I was stuck there, frozen in place, paralyzed by fear. And then it stepped into the light, and this thing was no man. Yes, it had the shape of a man, it moved like a man would. But it looked like someone had taken the darkest, most black smoke you could find and crafted it into the figure of a man. The smoke swirled and twisted inward on itself, almost as if some invisible barrier was holding it all in place. And the motion was slow, deliberate, and it seemed to absorb the light from above. Then this thing began to move forward, towards me, and my fight or flight response kicked in. I can still remember the exact thought that ran through my mind at that moment. Never back down. It was drilled into my head over the years from my instructors. Showing fear will only strengthen your opponent. In that same moment, I took a sliding step forward toward that thing and, raising my fist, was preparing for a fight. To my surprise, it retreated, moving backwards swiftly down the alleyway and disappearing. When I get back inside the club, I walk straight to the bar and had a shot of vodka. My mind was completely blown by my first encounter with the Shadow Man. Later, he would return and I wouldn't fare so well against him. My wife and I had lived along the bayous of southeast Louisiana our entire life. Hell, we grew up in the swamps. One of the proudest moments I can ever remember is when we bought our three-bedroom home. Talk about waterfront property. Our house is directly on a waterway. And we have a front row seat to all of nature's wonders. Since we've been in this house, we've seen a lot of strange things. Alligators on our porch. Rabbits and deer running by. But the strangest thing that we've seen over and over again is that around the end of the month, we get a special visitor. You call him Dog Man. We call him the Rougarou. My wife and I often sit out on the porch and drink coffee late at night, just talking and laughing. And the first time we saw this creature, we thought it was extremely odd. Now to paint a clear picture for you, my house is up on stilts, way above sea level. 
and from this vantage point to give us a clear view of the land. After you walk down my front set of steps, you have about 15 feet before you walk straight into the bayou. There's a landmass across the bayou from our property. And the way we're situated, the bayou kind of forms a T. The waterway that runs directly into our, in front of our property then splits going right and left. On the far side of that split is a levee. You can often see deer and rabbit and all kind of wild creatures move along that levee to get back and forth throughout the bayous. Like I was saying, I still remember the first time we saw the dog man. My wife and I were sitting there drinking coffee, talking, and I was smoking a cigarette. And my wife stood up and said, hey, what's that over there? By the light of the moon, you can see a tall object moving. It walked upright like a man on two legs, but it moved kind of awkwardly, as if its upper body was leaning forward as it moved. My wife hustled into the house and grabbed the spotlight, and when we shined it across the bayou, what we saw, we couldn't believe. I mean, this thing was huge, but it had the head of a dog. When it looked over at us shining the light, its eyes glistened this amberish yellow color. Then it turned his head and continued about his business. 20 yards later, it dove into the bayou, swam across to the levee, climbed up, and took off running. Now we've seen this creature over and over and over again. And not once have we felt threatened. In fact, we just figured it was ignoring us. So it was a part of the wildlife and entertainment for us. That was until one evening my wife had this bright idea of having a house party. Now, house parties on the bayou are not exactly a wine and cheese event. We're talking about LSU football, Budweiser, cigarettes, whiskey, shotguns, screaming and talking loud. It's just, it's a party. And since we're out here on the bayou, there's no neighbors close by to complain to the cops. That night, my wife and I had been out on the porch talking. David, one of my co-workers, was there for the party. He had been shooting my shotgun all day long. He wasn't shooting at anything particular. More than anything, he was shooting just for the hell of it. Well, as night came, we all moved inside and left David out on the porch. Beer in his left hand and shotgun in his right. And as my wife and I stood around talking in the kitchen, entertaining our guests, Dave came rushing into the front door, grabbed a box of shotgun shells, and hauled ass back outside. At first, I thought nothing of it. I just figured he was going to waste another $12 box of shotgun shells. Next thing you know, he's blasting away. Shot after shot after shot. It sounded like World War II was going on outside of my house. My wife looked me in the eye and said, go take that gun from Dave before he does something stupid. And when I walked out of the front door, that's when I realized what he was doing. Our friend, the Rougarou, was passing by just as he normally did. And for whatever crazy reason, David got scared or whatever was going on, but he started shooting at it. Now, keep in mind, this thing had been passing by our house for the past 12 to 18 months and never once came anywhere close. Now as I looked across the bayou, it was walking directly towards us. I looked at David and said, man, what are you doing? He was like, you act like you don't see that monster over there. I said, of course I see it. Why are you shooting at it? It's a monster. We began to tussle a bit as I tried to take the shotgun away from him, which caught the attention of everybody inside the house. And they all came rushing out to the front porch. Now, while I'm attempting to take this loaded shotgun from Dave, who's had over 15 beers, my wife is constantly hitting me on the back saying, it's coming this way, it's coming this way. After about three to four minutes of pushing and shoving, I finally was able to wrestle the shotgun from his grip. And when I turned my attention to the other side of the bayou, there it was, standing right on the edge of the waterway, no more than 50 yards away, looking directly at me. This creature was not afraid of us or the shotgun. It stood there staring at us. Its eyes glistened that same amberish yellow color illuminated by the floodlights on the front of my house. Everything went silent. No one talked and it didn't move, almost as if we were in some type of Mexican standoff. Then this creature looked directly at me, turned around and walked the other way. 
now I don't know about you, but I don't know of any creature in the wild that behaves this way. Since that night, we've seen it multiple times, and it's never come back near our house again. Part of me feels like we have this unspoken understanding with this creature. We'll leave it alone as long as it leaves us alone. And I intend to maintain that same understanding. Because I would never want this thing coming in my house to get me. What's up ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy Dog Waters checking in with you guys. The video upcoming right now is a rebroadcast. And I'm telling you guys now, you have this one plus another one, which is extremely long, like an hour long, coming down the pipeline. After that, we're right back into the brand new content that you love. Um, so bear with me on that. I did some traveling over the weekend and uh, did not get a chance to sit still and create much new stuff. <clears throat> Also, there's something that I need to address to the Dark Waters family. Friday, there was a, this past Friday, there was an incident um, between the Vault of Nightmares channel, the Vault Keeper, and D Dolls at BDRP. Um, everybody doesn't know about it because it, it wasn't really a huge spat, to be honest with you guys, but it was a spat. The two gentlemen have spoken and they both. Uh, had a conversation. I was on the phone through it when they had the conversation. It was a contentious conversation, but they both agreed to disagree and go on their own separate ways. And I want to commend them both for doing that. Um, as you guys know, here at the Dark Waters family and the Dark Waters channel, irregardless of what some of the naysayers may say, each and every time we have an incident with somebody, we like to reach out to that person and try and resolve it in an, in a calm manner. We, I don't, you know, we don't believe at talking at people. We believe at talking to people. That way, there's always a way back from any type of argument, as opposed to something getting a little bit more serious than what it possibly, you know, as opposed to something getting more serious than it needs to be. You know, as you guys can tell, I'm choosing my words very carefully here. So, in this particular case, those two gentlemen have spoken and they have worked it all out. Um, and the incident really, really revolved around. To be completely and totally honest with you, it revolved around the misinformation that people tend to spread. And what I mean by misinformation, it was escalated because D. Dawes is under the impression that um, someone threatened him and his family, which that never happened. We don't do that kind of stuff. And I can speak for Vault myself when I say that, that 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 never came out of anybody's mouth. But a part of this YouTube game, when things spill out into the open, is um, two individuals have an incident and they go at it with each other. And instead of everybody sitting on the sideline and keeping their mouth closed and just watching what happens and then pushing those two gentlemen to discuss it, you have people who want to egg the conflict on. They want to see blood in the streets. They want to see people have beef. But those people typically are people who are sitting at home behind their computers, i.e. how I came up with the name Hot Pockets. So typically you have the Hot Pockets sitting behind their computers, egging things on, um, trying to stir stuff up doing i mean doing amazing things hacking people's computers doing all this other kind of stuff because they want to turn two people against each other and oftentimes the creators get of the mindset of the creators get it confused like these people are on my side no they're not on your side they're egging things on in order to make a greater conflict where you or someone else stands to lose the the more public the conflict the greater the conflict is the more dangerous it becomes and while all this danger is going on for the two creators, these people are there egging it on from the comfort of their own homes and behind their computers under their little uh, Smurf blankets. The reason why I interjected in that situation um, is because I love Vault like a brother. And as a brother, I, I heard what was going on and I didn't like it. So I interjected in the conversation. Now, I want to address some people on the side of the Dalt Waters side of the fence, Adult Waters family side of the fence who've been egging things on trying to make it seem like uh, there was no support for vault in the altercation that was the epitome of supporting a friend 
And if you don't understand what it is to be a friend, Betty, let me say this. If you don't understand what I did is the true definition of friendship, then you don't understand anything about life. So fuck you. And as for the people on D Dawes' side of the fence, D Dawes has spoken to me, spoken to Vault. D Dawes has said over and over, hey man, I don't want no more drama. I just want to go ahead and do my own thing. So for those of you who may be over there looking to instigate and start and do things, I think he just came out and made a statement um yesterday where he said independent anybody who does anything independently, I don't support none of that. And that's where these type of altercations and YouTube stuff should end. Where two gentlemen have conversations and it ends. Now, the guys in between who want to start shit and do shit, hey, man, you're going to be the ones who end up getting hurt. Because these two gentlemen have spoken. And they've spoken behind the scenes. But you're going to be the one who has a fucking problem because you're the one egging it on. And so now it's clear that you're interjected and egging it on. All right? So keep up doing what you're doing. I can tell you is this. If there's an organized attack or organized movement, which I've heard that you guys are trying to do against myself and vote based on some total bullshit that I tried to squash, I will organize and squash you. So it's all good. Dark Waters family. With that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed the stories. Um, The format, I've almost got everything squared away for the call in show. I'm working on it tonight uh, and hopefully I have that done for you guys. To where we can have the call in show I think that's going to be very exciting I'm literally at the computer working on that right now And um, we're going to have some new stories coming up But I needed to address that one thing And I think that sums it all up It doesn't get into the muck muck of what happened Because the muck muck just, just doesn't really matter at this point Once two people talk about it And agree to disagree And bada bing bada boom it, Who gives a damn Alright it's your boy Dark Water signing out Attention all members of the Dark Waters family. I'm proud to announce to you guys that the Dark Waters channel t-shirts are now for sale. Many of you have asked me before, hey Dark Waters, why don't you have a Patreon account? Or why don't you do Super Chat? That's because I believe in earning my profits. I don't believe in taking any donations or taking any gifts. So if you really want to support me and the Dark Waters channel and the effort that I'm putting forward, the best way to do so is to buy the t-shirts and the products that will be rolling out over the next couple of months. I'm very excited about the products that are going to be hitting the market. Get your Dark Waters t-shirt today. While supplies last, it's only $25 that includes shipping and handling.